first three days, like my third day at the URA, I'd never, you know, been really in the city that often and that much. I was asked to go to a neighborhood with two of my white coworkers. I was like, sure. And I get there, and it's a black neighborhood. And it was at a, and I was like, well, yeah, you guys invited me to come out here because I'm the black person who you feel comfortable around. Now, yeah, so and so was at a meeting with us. Really? <laughs> my coworkers are going to meetings because they understand that they have to do this. And they understand that no one's going to do anything bad to them. I mean, one on one conversations are good things. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, so much better. Didn't that feel better? Yeah. yeah, okay. So, my name is Dr. Atia Martin, Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Boston, out of the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Racial Equity. It is such a pleasure to see all of you with us today. We are so excited to have Loeb Fellow Karen Abrams with us, who is amazing. So for those of you who don't know, she was the Community and Diversity Affairs Manager at the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Pittsburgh, and much of what she's going to share with us today is her experiences, lessons learned, as well as the intersection of that with research that she's been conducting um, and potential ways that we could learn from it for Boston um, in the work that she's been doing. She also um, has been developing um, educational tools for Boston neighborhood organizations um, and is mentoring two urban design startups at MIT. And I'm so glad that this day is actually happening. And one thing I will say for the folks who don't know is um, the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Racial Equity is working on the City of Boston's first resilient strategy. And for the City of Boston, our focus is the intersection of resilience and racial equity, social justice, and social cohesion um, in recognition that in order for us to have true citywide resilience, we have to put those issues at the forefront so that we don't perpetuate inequities, and more importantly, that we advance racial equity and social justice in the city of Boston intentionally, um, both in terms of how we navigate as individuals and as institutions in the city of Boston, that it's a personal and institutional responsibility. All that said, the work that she's about to present to you really draws a strong connection between the role of communities in this world of resilience and more particularly in terms of how we think about um, the way that government can engage with and partner with communities. So, so now officially I get to turn it over to the wonderful Karen Abrams. Um, thank you so much. It's really good to see you all. I'd like to thank uh, the Office of Resilience and Racial Equity, Dr. Martin and Sam and Denise helping me put this together. Um, and also I have to give a shout out to the Office of Urban Mechanics. Um, a lot of the work that I've done um, is very similar to theirs and I didn't know that they existed until probably about two or three years ago. Um, so I'm really excited about potentially working with them as well as your office in Pittsburgh. Um, so I, as Dr. Martin said, I, this is really my experience around community engagement work. Um, not necessarily a manual, not necessarily something that you know, Boston should do, but just more of a glimpse at a second tier city. Um, Pittsburgh um, is not like Boston or New York or San Francisco, the exciting places that people talk about often talking about urban planning and design. Um, but we are going through a renaissance, and so just sharing you the, some of the challenges, opportunities that we have um, in that space. So this is kind of my philosophy and also the philosophy of the Urban Development Authority of Pittsburgh as we deal, work with communities in, of color, specifically African American communities in Pittsburgh. So just a quick overview of kind of what I'll talk about. Um, just my work um, in engagement and outreach, which is kind of what we were doing for some time now, and then how we're transforming, we're actually um, evolving over education and participation um, with community organizations. Um, jargon. I use jargon way too much. I don't like using it, and because URA is my, where I work, and I have to be short as URA, so that's what you'll see at the Urban Development Authority. Most of you know GSD, DUSP, um, CMU, um, PGH is abbreviation for Pittsburgh, and I'll use that on the slides. And UDREAM, which is an acronym that I always get messed up, but it's a program out of, the, out of CMU, already using the jargon. <laughs> So I just wanted to give you some context um, of Pittsburgh. 
It is in Pennsylvania, which is considered the Northeast, but it is not a Northeastern city. That is like very, very important to understand. Um, we're more connected with the Midwest. Um, when I first got to, to graduate school out in the Pittsburgh area, they were like, you're no longer in the Northeast, you're in the Midwest now. I didn't really know what that meant, but um, it's definitely a different place than, than Pittsburgh. I mean, than Philadelphia. And as you can see, Philadelphia is on the other side of Pennsylvania. It's literally a five hour drive. So these are very separate cities with very different um, demographics, very different ways of doing things and very different histories. Um, this is Pittsburgh in the circle. Um, it's in the middle of Allegheny County. It's one of 130 municipalities in um, Allegheny County, which is a lot. So it's, it's definitely a place that has a lot of, um, you know, little fiefdoms that have existed for some time now due to, the, due to industry. And then we have 90 neighborhoods as well. So it's kind of a continuation of where Pittsburgh is. So for around the late 1800s up until um, a few years ago, a few decades ago, um, Pittsburgh was an essential part of um, powering as well as pulling infrastructure to this country full of steel and coal. That was really the industry that kind of built this country. And they'll tell you that, that Pittsburgh built this country. Um, and it, it actually brought a lot of wealth, obviously a lot of people. We have immigrants from all over the world who settled in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But then, at the decline of those industries, there has been an outward migration of uh, folks in the, in the city. So we went for approximately one million people in the city, down to 30,000 people in the city. So it's a huge outward migration. Um, steel uh, exports, the steel industry is now you know, heavily in China, it's, it's less expensive, and so people just tended to just leave. And all the ancillary industries left with the steel industry. So we're down to less than half of our population at its peak around uh, 1950. And so we have this thing called Steeler Nation. Um, it is a real thing. Um, there's a steeler bar in almost every single state as a reflection of the fact that people left the city in droves. I mean, it's everywhere but here. There are, no, there are not very many Pittsburgh um, bars up in New England. <laughs> um, but, I mean, if you see, you know, it's, it's spread out all over the, the country. Um, so, at this point in time, we're going through a renaissance. Uh, steel's gone, coal's gone. Um, we have about 10 universi universities and colleges in the area. Um, CMU and Pitt being um, the largest ones, but they're really driving the innovation economy in Pittsburgh. Um, Uber, is some news that Uber might not be around in Pittsburgh very long, but it really is um, a, a big part of the driverless car um, push. We have Ford driverless cars, we have another Aurora is coming in, and we also have Google. So CMU and Pitt and other places are really driving this innovation economy around high tech. So that's really where we are. Um, as far as our economy now. And we're really trying to foster that economy. And a lot of that is coming out of the URA, which is where I work. So um, the Urban Redevelopment Authority has been instrumental and key to bringing um, tax, the tax base back to Pittsburgh. Um, for the most part, while the steel industry was dying, philanthropy helped drive that as far as the money. We have a lot of philanthropic organizations in Pittsburgh um, it's pretty high per capita. Um, we have a, our largest foundation, I think, has like a 60, I mean, a $600 million endowment. And we've got tons of foundations. A lot of it is from the steel and coal industry. And it's Heinz Ketchup is also in Pittsburgh. So the Heinz endowment is a pretty large one as well. Um, but we actually, at the URA, work to increase the, um, our tax base. We work with businesses. I mean, pretty much what the BPDA does here in Boston. We do a lot of work similar to that. And so it was really important for us. I mean, it was established, it was established back in 1950 um, during urban renewal when a lot of other redevelopment authorities were established too. Um, and the state chartered. We have a board of directors, similar to the BPDA, about 100 employees um, in over 90 neighbors that we're actually servicing. And so there's a history in Pittsburgh of the URA pretty much, um, I won't use the word destroy, but I mean, people tell you that they've destroyed black neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. Um, they basically displaced around 5,000 businesses and residents in the Lower Hill District near downtown to, to create um, what was then used for the Penguins um, hockey rink. Um, there's a lot of distrust. And so working at the URA at this point in time is important because as we are going to do, do development 
in these black neighborhoods and really trying to figure out the trust issues there. So this brings me to kind of our demographics. So um, we, are, the last census in 2010, we were the least diverse metropolitan city of like the top 100. So we really don't have a lot of diversity there. And when we do have diversity in Pittsburgh, it's really black and white. We have a very small Asian population and a very small Spanish population. Um, and it's probably more than this 2.3% because there are undocumented people who are living in the area and we, we actually recognize that. We're, we're also a sanctuary city. And so we really do want to welcome more people in, but we really are a black and white city. Um, and then things get pretty bad. You can see the, the, the um, disparity in income. So basically black residents of Pittsburgh make less than white residents by half. Um, this has been a tremendous drag on the city economically. It's been a drag out on these families who are making, you know, who are really making any money. Huge unemployment compared to the rest of the country and compared to their white counterparts in Pittsburgh. So these things are, are also adding to the frustration of residents, um, obviously. And so a lot of, I'm not sure if you can see this very well, but I've circled some of the neighborhoods, neighbors that are in orange. Um, are the poorest neighborhoods, they tend to be mostly African-American, like 90% African-American residency, up to the red, and then purple is wealthier. So we've got like a ton of neighborhoods, and it's a concentration of poverty in these neighborhoods because there's no, there's really very few opportunities for people to move up um, as far as mobility. And the disparities are not just around wealth. I mean, obviously that's, that's a result of um, poor, um, you know, the schools are not in such great shape huge dropout rate in schools, um, health issues. I mean, there's just every, like, we have really horrible disparities in Pittsburgh. So it really boils down to these three things, right? I mean, if you really cut through it, it is about racism. It is about social racism, institutional racism, and personal bias, and these things feed themselves. Um, so we're, we're really, and it's hard to really <laughs> work with people who don't want to acknowledge it. Um, we talk about the Hill District, which is where I live and where there was a displacement of residents. Um, there's a huge disregard for people's livelihoods and their lives. And it's still difficult to this day to talk about race in Pittsburgh. Um, but we're now recognizing at the URA at least that we really need to really kind of dig into these issues and really discuss them openly. So this is just in general, just like really kind of not just Pittsburgh specific, but very much around the around legacy cities and Rust Belt cities. I mean, we're all dealing with a need to increase our tax base, but at the same time, really dealing with inequities that are, are occurring in our neighbors and in our cities. Um, government transparency is not easy when trying to build up a tax base. Um, you want community input, but that kind of slows things down. It slows down the process. And so we're getting a little bit better about that. We have a lot of high-tech jobs because of the, the um, innovation economy, but we don't have people who, are, who have the skills, education to fill those jobs. So a lot of people are coming in from other places to fill those jobs. So we have a lot of what we call transplants, and I'm a transplant from New York, um, but we have a lot of people coming from out of, out, of the, out, of, out of Pittsburgh coming to the city. And again, the development pressures in places like Boston and New York and San Francisco, we get a lot of people coming from other places to fill those jobs. And so there's a fearful future for just in general, like the average Pittsburgher, but even more so for African Americans in Pittsburgh, because there's a fear of displacement. Um, so this is an old Pittsburgh versus new Pittsburgh dynamic that's happening, that's playing out right now in the city. So let's get to where I kind of what I do. So I arrived in my job in 2011, and this is essentially like I was confronted with all of these issues. Um, there were no black planners in Pittsburgh back then. Um, and my white coworkers were very reluctant to go into black neighborhoods, which obviously created a huge problems. Um, three neighborhoods were going through um, land use planning. So, you know, having this dispa these disparities and all this anger and all this frustration and mistrust, like I kind of walked into this. And so I'll just kind of paint a, a picture of what community engagement was like. We'll tell you what to do, resident, we're gonna do. We'll give you a 10 minutes to ask questions, and that's it. And we all have seen this process take place. It still takes place. Uh, we got a little bit better. Um, this is basically an example of, you know, this, this is a room of people, full of people. We've got government employees or developers coming in, and they're talking to folks. 
the one brave soul or two who has a question, who wants to get up in front of 100 people and ask a question, I mean, that's not a very comfortable situation to be in. But they do, and we do it. And it's still important to do these things, but they can't be the only solutions. Community outreach. You know, we go out to communities on weekends and in evenings, take part in community-related events and festivals. That's also good. It's a good way to start to build a community or building trust, but it's not the whole picture. And then we have technology, which reaches more people, but it's still this computer screen in front of you. It's not a real person talking to you. So and that's necessarily a great way to do it. So these three things are very important, but it's not going to do it. So how do you change your strategy around this? And I found this article in the Harvard Business Review a couple of days ago. I'm like, this is exactly what I've been trying to do. And it's kind of con a confirmation of like how we need to actually approach um, a, new com a new community engagement uh, philosophy at the, at, the, at the URA. So I had to really think about, I have all these partners. I work with philanthropy, I work with city planning, I work with residents, I work with nonprofits, I work with um, other cities. So you know, what do I do with all these resources that I have? So you know, I have this huge network. That's hard to throw parties at my house. Um, these are people who I just kind of, you know, they came together. Um, my neighbors would come, people from philanthropy would come, the mayor's office people would come, and it just really was an opportunity for me to, to pull people together who haven't been together um, in, a, in a more informal setting. It was a way for me to get ideas from people who I talk to closely over drinks. Um, sometimes a, a boardroom or a conference room isn't where you really want to let yourself, your guard down, but you know, in my backyard it was very comfortable. Um, so it's informal, it's fun, the food and drink, people just roll in with their friends, um, but it also strengthens relationships, it builds social networks, and people have a new experience. So I live in a neighborhood that a lot of people just never came to my neighborhood. They, the news would talk about the one or two murders a year. That was, you know, a big deal, but so there was a fear around it. But when they got there, they were like, oh, this is what your neighborhood looks like. <laughs> so it's just dispelling all these stereotypes about black communities in Pittsburgh also. Uh, so yeah, these are some of the people who I work with and who've been really instrumental in my work. Um, and we have lively debates in my backyard. Uh, so it's just a really great experience. So they've helped me pull together a lot of the ideas that I do have here today. I can't take full responsibility for it, but they've been a really an important part of working around community education, engagement, participation. So one of the first things that I actually did, and there's, there are toolkits out there that we can pass, along, pass around later on, but these are really small interventions with neighborhoods who've never worked with the Urban Redevelopment Authority before. Um, these are places that are not necessarily remote, but they just haven't had anybody go out to them. Um, and there's been a fear and distrust about coming to the URA. And so it started out in 2013, a councilman and my boss, who's the director of the Redevelopment Authority, we kind of came up with an idea to kind of do these small interventions with communities. So that they have an opportunity to engage with us. We have an opportunity to know what their needs and desires are and to kind of pull together a mini planning process. Nothing, it's like a year long process. They have a couple of meetings and do some research, but really like working with them. We provide them with um, some tools, there's a toolkit there that really allows them to, to see where to find resources. And they also, they also have contact with the URA and city planning. And after these year-long processes, we invite them into monthly meetings at the URA. So they can actually see the people who are actually impacting their lives. And they can actually see where, where the power around that is, and they can be a part of that power-sharing structure. It's so important for people to come in and see where things happen. And it's amazing how impactful that is on on what they're able to, how they think about themselves and how they think about their communities and how they think about us um, at the end of that process. So that's one thing that, that I've, program that I've instituted that's, that's kind of still running. Um, the second thing that I did recently was this program called Urban Matters. And it's for high school students. And I, I wrote this quote, explains like I'm a 15 year old. Um, we, again, jargon, jargon, jargon. We know what we're talking about to each other, but when it comes to community, how do they even know what this is like? So I figured if a 15-year-old can understand it and explain it, <laughs> then most people could probably understand it and explain it. Um, it's a program that um, I started actually with the help of the Heinz Endowments back in about 2013. Um, I, we went to see the Center of Urban Pedagogy in Brooklyn, New York, 
Um, they are a great organization, and they came out to train us on this program, but basically it provides an opportunity for young people to actually discover the city. And they research a topic that impacts their neighborhoods. Um, it could be legislation, it could be a, a planning process or anything, but they actually go out and research, they meet um, the people who impact that particular policy. They actually interview those folks, um, and they put together a document or a video or an exhibit based upon that research, and they actually share it with um, their, um, their peers, their parents, so the community comes out and actually celebrates with them. So this is an example of some of the um, people who are really instrumental in it. There is a process that the URA has. We select the organization through an RFP process, a request for proposals. Um, they have a teaching artist that actually works with them. We picked the topic because um, kids know what they know and they, they're, not, they're not very curious about urban planning and design. So we try to at least pick a topic for them that they can research and learn more about. And because we know what impacts the community in ways that they may not think about, we try to at least set a, set a stage where they can actually, it's an easy enough topic, um, but you know they will have some appreciation for it. And also, I really do want to build an army of like black planners and black urban designers. And so this is important for me personally because we really don't have that many. Uh, so this is the mayor at the top right. He agreed to do an interview with, this, with the students. Um, some kids didn't even know who the mayor was. And so this is really important for them to actually see the person who's running um, the city. Um, there are young people who learn around audio, audio video. Um, Techniques, um, 21st century skills are very important uh, because obviously, you know, a lot of the a lot of the working class communities in Pittsburgh haven't been transferred from you know low tech to high tech jobs, and so learning these skills, learning how to interview, learning how to ask questions, and being curious about things is important. And also, exploring the city. Some of these kids they go to school in the neighborhoods, they do everything in the neighborhoods. They don't get out to the city, and so it's important for African American kids to feel like the city is. They, they have ownership of the city. They can go wherever they want to go, like everybody else does. And they don't get that impression oftentimes. So going into City Hall is a huge deal for some of these young people, and seeing where power is is, is a huge deal for them. And it also inspires them. And so they even they make their own posters to promote their work. They make t-shirts. So they do all this work to promote the celebration, and they have a celebration. The panel discussion, they talk about their experiences, they ask, they answer questions about the topic. So the land bank, we had Pittsburgh created the land bank back in 2014, legislation for land bank. And they interviewed about a thousand about 150 people. Only six people knew what a land bank was. So they did a nine-minute video explaining what a land bank was and interviewing people about it. My, the, the CIO of the URA didn't know what it was until they saw this video. So this was a huge, and, they, and we used this video to go to community groups around the city to explain what a land bank was. So it was an important part of, of teaching residents in the city about what's happening. Um, and they were a part of it. So they were really inspired. The kids were like, I want to go to, you know, I want to learn about architecture. I want to do a construction company. I mean, they really were getting into how they can actually improve and be a part of their neighborhoods. So that was an important piece. Uh, so now I'm thinking about jargon cards, and I've mentioned the jargon earlier, because I think it's important that residents understand, or at least you know, have an opportunity to understand what this jargon is. And this is something that I was like, I didn't think about this like before, but I'm working with um, Professor um, Cesar McDowell, who some of you know at MIT, and two students at the GSD, on these cards. And basically, we're gonna do a series of decks of cards um, for residents in Roxbury. Uh, because I was asked to do a glossary um, a while back by one of the community groups, and so we decided, well, we'll just do a deck of cards. Because we can do a glossary, it's easy, a piece of paper, but the cards, you can play games with them, and young people can use them. And it's a lot more fun to use, to have cards around. So this is a project that's actually finishing up now. And I'm thinking about introducing it into Pittsburgh when I get back. So this is part of my low fellowship work. So part of what I'm thinking about community engagement education is not just really about residents, but it's also about people like us, the practitioners, recent graduates, um, students who actually are in school learning about um, urban planning and design and development. 
So I'm going to go back to the toolkit project again because this is another part of that project that's actually very important. Uh, so every single, for the past four years, Carnegie Mellon University, CMU, has had this, pro this program called UDREAM. It's basically for recently graduating or graduated um, young people, young African Americans mostly, but it's open to minority groups across the board. They work, um, they basically go to, they go to Carnegie Mellon for, for maybe a couple months, a couple of classes, and they're farmed out to different organizations throughout the city. And the URA is the only government agency that actually takes these young people in. But this is, these are the people who do the community toolkits. And so what it offers them is an opportunity to expand their portfolios, but also get out into community. Um, I can't even begin to tell you how many tears I have seen, the stress of speaking in front of a community group from these young people. Um, it is, <laughs> I've gotten yelled at <laughs> and screamed at, but in the end, they come out and they're so grateful for the experience because residents don't bite. If you're working with them, if you're talking to them, and if you're engaging with them, and you're asking them what they want, and what, questions and how they can help, they're actually really happy to see you in the community. Something that they're not used to because no one teaches them these things. And so it's really important for me to, to help them understand that when you're working in an environment where you talk to residents about urban design and planning, that you have the tools and skills that you need to work with them. A lot of us feel like we work, that, they, that they were working maybe the authority or the power I told them to do. And this is a way for us to say, no, you have to work with community around this. And so they have a very different perspective around it. But there is a process that they go along with. They actually go to a community meeting. Um, they lay it out like a charrette, you know, which is that planning process that we do with communities. Um, they come back to the URA they work with the city council person. They work with, um, they work with planning, nonprofits, the residents research, they're out in the neighborhoods, so they're actually getting, they're digging into the topics of the neighborhood that the residents really care about. They put out a flyer about the next meeting that's coming up, and then they, they report out and find out if what they did was correct, which changes need to be made, and they go back and make them. So I have them over there, like I said before, but this is Mary Taylor, and she did a toolkit in Beltuber. And what's cool about this is the mayor was like, oh, there's a toolkit here. He, he tweeted it out to like all of his followers. And then she was featured briefly. She was featured in Pittsburgh Magazine. So, you know, this is something that they understand is a really great experience. And they probably won't, they would not have gotten it anywhere else but our agency um, in Pittsburgh. So I'm really happy about this program. And it's, it's, it costs us like $2,000 to print out the books and that's pretty much it. So it's a really inexpensive way to actually do good community work. Uh, while I was a Loeb fellow, um, one of the fellow, my fellow Loeb's, uh, Emmanuel Pratt and I, we co-created a program called Saturday Shop Series. And because there were so many students who wanted to meet with us, I mean, it, it's great to have people wanting to know what you do, but coffee with all the students who ask us over a course of nine months can get a little overwhelming. So we wanted to kind of pull everybody into a room on a Saturday to talk about certain topics. And so we had um, about 30 participants in all, uh, both students and practitioners from both MIT and Harvard GSD. Um, four Loeb's presented, we did about five workshops um, around participatory planning, civic design, um, broadband for planners and communication for planners and um, working with aging populations as well. And so it was a really successful program that I want to bring back to Pittsburgh as well, because I think it could work in Pittsburgh with residents. And Courtney and I talked about the idea of sharing information and sharing. So we want communities to do these workshops as well, talk about what they want us to know about their communities. Okay. So this is kind of basically where we've come. We've come from a place of distrust a place of fear, um, and a place where people were not necessarily open to working with the URA, and even you are working with neighborhoods. And so right now, we're using nonprofit models in government. Um, we're collaborating as a unit, as an authority, um, as an organization, as opposed to just Karen going out, because I'm doing community engagement. Uh, we're partnering with residents and others to build programming at the URA. So we're not just doing it ourselves, we're actually using people who are in communities and who have expertise around neighborhoods. 
and we're open to experimentation and failure. And I can't tell you how many times I have made a mistake and I've messed up and my boss is like, okay, we'll just try a different way this time. So that's actually really important because people have a fear of failure. I don't have a fear of failure anymore because I've made so many mistakes along the way, but some things that are great happened out of those experiences. Um, and of course, creating ways of engagement and participation other than just going to a community meeting, people are engaging in real ways. Um, I was called, somebody gave me a call and they were like, are you having a party when you come back? Because <laughs> I mean, those, those parties were a big part of people's social network um, and even professional network as well. I'm the only agency actually working with young people in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm trying to get the city planning department to kind of come along with us. Um, and we're doing a real deep dive into racial equity um, at, the, at the URA, racial justice issues, because we really feel it's important. So I'm going to use a couple of minutes to explain to you a really bad but good experience <laughs> that occurred a couple years ago. So the office of the mayor and the Heinz Endowments, one of our larger foundations, decided to pull together a summit around people, place, planet, and performance really you know, great goals and great you know, aspirations around what the city and the region are going to be in the next 20 years. What they didn't do was invite very many people of color. And on top of it, to make matters worse, they were using a, a Scandinavian model. Like They were like, the Scandinavians do great work. We'll bring it to Pittsburgh. So that was kind of awkward. Uh, there were no speakers from Pittsburgh, black or white. Um, the three black speakers they had, and they were great, but they were only in people. So it, it gave the impression that black people in Pittsburgh don't care about place or planet. So I forced my way into this conference, and it was a really important part time of my life because at the URA we've done all these great things. We've done all this work around equity. And to have this happen in the city, even my boss was like, this is really bad optics. So about maybe a month after the conference, and we, and we did confront, not confront, I shouldn't say confront, but we did address the issues with the highs and downs. And the mayor's office and the group of us thought, we have to say something about this because it, we can't let this continue to happen. So about a month later, I went on the PolicyLink website. PolicyLink is an organization um, in California that works on issues of equity um, and policy for cities. And they saw that they had this equity summit that was coming up in California in a couple of months. I sat at my desk and I literally emailed the mayor's office, the chief of staff, the director of planning, my director. I emailed about 30 people. Um, and these are not just like my coworkers. These are people who are pretty high up in organizations. And I was kind of risking a lot just writing this email, you know. And I said, we need to go to this conference. We need to get people, a delegation to this conference. Immediately, I got responses and the reply alls from a lot of people who were saying we have to, we have to, we have to pull us together. So again, back to this is now the city thinking differently because it's not just my organization at this point. I mean, we knew that we had to do something more. Um, the city was still thinking very, you know, very small around these things, and we had to get them to think a little bit differently. So my boss and I talked about creating, really kind of formalizing our equity working group. Um, we're the only organization, actually, um, the only agency in the government that has an equity working group in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and we thought that it would be important for the city to see that we're doing this kind of work, especially the URA. Um, we thought it was an opportunity for us to look at our policies because a lot of our policies keep people out um, and look at the way we, we um, treat each other as employees, talk about racism and personal bias. Um, and we also knew that it was important um, for us to really educate ourselves around these issues and bring in consultants. And at the same time, um, the Heisen Endowments hired a consultant to kind of talk to them about racial equity as well because they were impacted by um, the reaction to this conference. And the mayor's office actually got a consultant as well. So we really started to do something here with you know, larger parts of the city. So we ended up getting around 30 people from in the city um, to this conference. Heinz Endowments paid about $50,000. URA sent 
about eight employees. Another agency sent about 10 more employees. So it was the Poise Foundation, which is the African American Foundation in Pittsburgh, the Heinz Endowments, the URA, and Neighborhood Allies. We sent 30 people to this summit. And they were not just from um, government, they were not just from planning, but they were from all sectors. We had people who were educated, we had artists. Um, we had other foundations join us. Um, we had uh, different nonprofits around the city. So we were looking at this from a very city-oriented perspective. And what came out of it, what's still coming out of this is pretty extraordinary. So you have people who just don't talk again, don't talk to each other. Um, we had a reception at the summit because we wanted people to know who everybody was. People didn't know who other people were at the delegation. Um, so when we came back from the summit, people were really revved up. People were really excited. My boss was like, okay, I gotta go out to the community. Okay, you know, he felt like, Director Yuri, I gotta go out to the community. So he was invited by a gentleman who's coordinating a lot of the work after the summit. We're doing, the all, we're doing an all in Pittsburgh, which is a policy link uh, program. So he's coordinating all that work, but he invited my boss to speak, to just come to this um, video. Um, he, well, actually, they were video recording um, this uh, talk around, I forgot what it was around, land use, something like that, but he showed up. And so he's literally sitting at a table with other residents, which he doesn't really do that much. But he felt that it was really, really important to do it, and he really had a great time. Another coworker of mine, director of real estate, also went out, and she goes out to communities now without having to ask me to go with her. Um, just an extraordinary, you know, occurrence that happened in the city that's still going on. Um, there have been meetings and meetings around what equitable development means, because that's actually a very loaded term that we kind of throw out there a lot of times. So what does it really mean for community? What does it really mean for the city and the region? Uh, we also, we actually been supporting this online magazine that does a lot of regional, a lot of work around land use and planning in the city of Pittsburgh and events. And we decided that we were gonna put money towards the black magazine to get ourselves out there. So we're talking to this um, publication called 1839 Magazine. I'm not sure if you all know Very Smart Brothers, Damon Young. Well, he does that blog. He was a Pittsburgh resident, and he actually is the editor of 1839. And it talks about issues of race and politics and community and arts. Um, the Heisen Diamond supports it now, but we're talking about supporting this financially to, to actually make sure that um, African-American residents in Pittsburgh continue to have a place where they can go to read about things that are happening. Um, we definitely don't want to influence the writing, but we want to make sure that it's still supported. So, And then in October, this was the P4 conference last year. So a year later, we had nine people speaking um, and everybody at this, well, most people here are local. Um, Angel Lugova Blackwell came back to speak, but the entire conference changed completely after talking to the Heisen Diamonds about it, after going to the Equity Summit, after doing talks about equitable development, after doing all in Pittsburgh. So we had a robust group of people talking about not just people, but talking about planet and place. We had a great um, seminar. I, I, came, I flew in to speak at it because I wanted to see from my own eyes like what was actually happening. Uh, so these are some of the things that we're still working on. Pittsburgh is still stuck in that place sometimes, but you know you've got to put put it out there and just say, hey, you can't do that anymore. You should do this. You should do something more inclusive of everybody. Um, and people are starting to listen. Um, I would love to see. We don't. Just to remind you, this is only one small piece of government. I'm jealous of Boston. You have two great offices that basically essentially do the work of like one person in Pittsburgh with the help of others in the mayor's office and city planning, but it's something formalized. And again, we're growing our tax base. We don't have the resources to really build the staff for this, but this would be a wonderful combination of things to have. And, and I just wanted to congratulate your city on having this and really utilizing it. I met Neil, is it Neil? Nigel, sorry. I met Nigel a couple of months ago. I haven't been able to reach out to him as, to him um, either, but I, I look forward to the opportunity um, when I go back to Pittsburgh to return to do this work, to come back and really work with Boston um, and your department, Dr. Martin, and the BPDA, as well as the new Urban Mechanics Office. So thank you very much. So, um, 
I, I apologize in advance because uh, Karen just talked about how frightening it can be to come up in front of a room of people to talk. However, for recording purposes, we just ask that folks come up to the podium on this side of the room to speak so that we can actually hear on the recording what the question you're asking. So thank you for your patience with us um, with that process. And if you have questions and you don't feel comfortable coming up to the microphone, um, we can stay a little while afterwards to answer some of your questions if that's okay with you. Okay, so let the fun and games begin. <laughs> questions. So I'm wondering um, how the planning processes and building projects have changed since you started doing this really impressive community outreach. <laughs> uh, so the, the planning, when my boss came on board a year after I started, was that we used to do what BPDA does. We, had, we used to do planning as well as development. And he says, we have a city planning department. Let them do city planning. Um, and we have a new director now. So we're actually going through two planning processes now. Um, when I got there, we had just finished three planning processes in black neighborhoods. And now that I'm here, we're starting two more. <laughs> so I'm not sure how the process works. I know that I was, hev I mean, I'm surprised, but I was asked to be a part of writing the RFP. And I made sure that the person running the RFP, and he was great, and he already had this in mind, but I wanted to make sure that specifically land use was the last thing on the list. Because land use tends to make people crazy. It's like a scramble for real estate. When in fact, community planning is not just land use. It is everything. It is public safety, it's education, it's health. And I wanted to make sure that the community spent time discussing those things because a lot of times they really are, they stick to the urban design and the land use, which really doesn't, that is that those other things that make people's lives better should, in, should influence the land use planning. And so that's something that I've been telling my boss about um, and talking to planning about because it's so important. So I mean, I don't know what's necessarily changed. I do think that people feel more comfortable asking questions and this, instead of just saying, this is your RFP, the community got to look at the RFP and make changes to it that they wanted to, to see changed. Um, they were very involved in selecting the consultant, actually, because when I was at the URA, when we did the planning processes and things, the community was in, involved in picking the consultant for the plan. So that was, those are important changes that have been made. I'm not sure if it was because of our work, because we don't do planning. But I think that the city recognizes that there needs to be something that's changed. And we have a mayor now who's, you know, who's, who really understands what planning is. I think he understands, we were very development heavy, so we just developed because we needed to bring tax base, we needed to bring co companies in. But Mayor Peduto is like, let's slow the development down a second and let's make sure that people are involved in this process of planning. So it's coming from different directions, which is great. But I do think that I'm, I'm, I work for the land use people, <laughs> but I want planning to be very much about people's lives. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I mean, it, we, I'm just trying to think about planning processes. Yeah, we haven't had many in black neighborhoods at least okay. up until recently. And we're starting actually, we're starting to actually now. So we'll see. I'll, 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 I'll let Dr. Martin know yeah. this changed at all. <laughs> Thanks. Well, good after. Well, evening, right? Go. Good afternoon. We're still in the afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Uh, my name is Jawan Skeens. I just have two quick questions for you. First, being, what is the age population of youth that you serve? Um, how early? How old? Start oh, there. So we, so it's high school students. Okay. So it's between 14, 15, and 18. Okay. okay. And for my second question, what is, what motivated you to like take this situation on personally? Because this is, you, you, you're not just talking about like, you know, like a, a regular like school setting. You're talking about like an entire local town there so like what encouraged you to take that by the straps and say i i'm the one to take this on this is what i need to do you mean for the 
Urban Matters, the, yeah, young, the, for, the youth project? Yes. Uh, well, two things. Um, one is that the program that the Heinz Endowments funded that looked at arts and culture in black neighborhoods, um, it was targeted towards young people. Um, so that kind of helped me kind of, you know, I wanted to keep in line with the programming. Yeah. But also, we, our planning is done around 20, for like looking forward 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really planning for me as a 46 year old. It's really a plan for a 15 year old. It really is about what does this neighborhood look like when they be, when they're 25 and when they're 30. You know, how do they get involved? They're they're going to be taking over this stuff. And you know, we don't have enough young people, especially young black people, looking at these issues. So I thought that was really important. And I will tell you, my mother's here, um, and uh, she's here for the commencement tomorrow with my nephew. But at a very young age, she was heavily influential around that part of my life. She worked in politics for a very long time. And so that's kind of why I do what I do in general, because okay. it's so important to be actively engaged. I mean, the political situation in Pittsburgh is something that's a whole other like, yeah. you know, yeah. talk. Um, but. She worked for Congressman Rangel's office, she worked for Dinkin Dinkins' office, the first black mayor. And so there's an experience that I had in New York as a New Yorker, and the one with my mother and her, um, her professional life that I did not see in Pittsburgh. And, and that was really, I was very sad to see the situation in that city um, when there were so many resources available for the residents there. And to be quite honest with you, it's unfair that somebody like me can come into Pittsburgh <coughs> when people have been doing this work in Pittsburgh for so long, and to recognize the fact that this is not just, you know, I didn't come in and decide to do this, but, you know, an indication of what the URA wasn't hiring people from Pittsburgh, they hired me. And it was a safe hire, so they thought, <laughs> um, because I didn't know what was going on, but I found out what was going on, and I made sure that they knew what was going on in the neighborhoods, and that we had to change these things. And I still talk about it, I risk a lot, Doing that, I know that I do, but it's totally worth it for me because that's just how I grew up. Yeah. So, <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm really curious about um, the activities that you did in which you were improving the community, well, might be improving the community engagement practices by the city. And one of the things that struck me is when you said you did these, some of these activities in which city folk, URA folk, went out to the communities and then invited them to these monthly meetings. And um, what I thought I heard you say, and I could have misheard, uh, was part of the, one of the good things that came out of that is you have community folk now meeting the city folk, and that's fantastic. My question is, in what way, or did, and in what way, if so, did the city folks' view of community residents that they don't normally see change, if at all? Um, that's a really good question. I th only way I know that it's changed because, again, because of the work that I've been doing, I, these you dreamers, the young people who do the community planning processes, they go off to work someplace else because we, we don't have the money to hire them. I mean, it's just, I've been trying to hire them for the longest time and I just can't. But they come into our offices and they, they stop by and say hi to me, but they're going off to housing department to talk to people. So that's changed a lot because usually they would come, they wouldn't even go to the housing department. The housing division wouldn't even invite them, you know, necessarily invite them in to talk. Um, so they're bypassing me completely, and I'm offended by that sometimes. <laughs> but it's it, it, it testament to like the fact that people feel comfortable talking to other people in my agency, um, and even speaking more openly with my coworkers about these issues. Um, I mentioned I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but when I, my first three days, like my third day at the URA, I've never, you know, been really in the city that often and that much. I was asked to go to a neighborhood with two of my white coworkers. I was like, sure. And I get there, and it's a black neighborhood. And, was that a, and I was like, well, yeah, you guys invited me to come out here because I'm the black person who you feel comfortable around. Now, yeah, so-and-so was at a meeting with us. Really? <laughs> my coworkers are going to meetings. 
because they understand that they have to do this. And they understand that no one's gonna do anything bad to them. I mean, one-on-one -on -one conversations are good things. Um, huge community meetings are not places where you can get to know people. So they tend to go to smaller events. And so I think it's changed a bit. I mean, there are people who won't buy into this, obviously. This is not all sunny. You know, this is not easy work for anybody to do. We all have our biases when we go into places, but I think um, understanding what they are, and they do understand what they are, and trying to work on them is important. And so there's still work to be done. There's a whole lot of work to be done, but I think there has been a change, definitely. Any other questions? Last Uh, good afternoon, my name is Emily. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at our local regional planning agency. So I work with 101 cities and towns, and that includes Boston. Um, so I love your work, congratulations, this is so amazing. We're also trying to challenge ourselves and do much more interactive outreach and engagement. And so my question for you is around resources. Um, so when you work with youth or community members, nonprofit organizations, did you provide stipends at all or monetary resources? How? Any other funders we can tap into? Uh, that kind of stuff. Thank you. Uh, OK, no, that's a great question because I, had, I basically beg for money all the time for everything that I do because um, I don't have a budget. Um, I'm actually the only department that doesn't have a, not really a department, but I don't have a budget. So I'm constantly writing grants. Um, the Heinz Endowments has been a huge supporter of my work. So, I mean, they do mostly regional funding, um, but they funded a lot of, they funded the Urban Matters program. Um, they gave a quarter million dollars to the Bell Super Group after that community toolkit. So they love the toolkit. They love the work that comes out of it. Um, Certain Foundation funded it. Um, just a little, it won't be a secret because I'm on, you know, I'm being recorded, but the guy who gave me the grant, he's a planner. He loved the idea of like young black which people learning about planning. <laughs> so he was all for it. And a couple of local foundations. So in Pittsburgh, we, ha we have a, a very robust foundation community. I'm not sure what it is in Boston, but like the national foundations would love to support this kind of work. I think, I mean, especially now with the current political climate, I think people, foundation communities have a lot more giving um, to kind of supplement what the government may be taking away. Um, but this is such important work that it's worth it to just write your proposal out and just send it out to everybody because somebody will bite. <laughs> Thank you. So, without further ado, join me in thanking Ms. Karen Abrams for today. <laughs> Whose idea is this? I mean, did you go to the community and say, do you want a continuation of the Emerald Necklace? Because sometimes that's a saying, you can't go back home. You know, this, the Emerald Necklace was created at a time 150 years ago. We are now way past that in terms of transportation modes, in terms of the density of this particular area. Is this really a good idea? <laughs>